Living Hope Church. Ooh, we're a little lively today. That's good. Glad to hear that. So my name's Melissa. If you don't know who I am, I am the youth director here at Living Hope Church. Hi, Melissa. Hi. <laughs> Pastor James told me that if I said Antetokounmpo, everyone would give me $10, so... <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. Okay, why don't we stand for God's word today? His word is alive and active, right? Amen. Okay, so hopefully it will speak new life into each of us today. It's interesting that I got to get this passage to read about the tongue. Thank you, Pastor Mike. <laughs> okay, here we go. James chapter 3. We're going to read 3 through uh, 1 through 18, and then into chapter 4, into verse 12, okay? It says, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble inward, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our God and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in the similitude or likeness of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. Who is wise in understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there but the wisdom that is from above is first pure then peaceable gentle willing to yield full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace make peace not keep sorry that's my little adjective, make peace. Um, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you make a miss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. 
Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge one another? Heavenly Father, we just ask for the remainder of this time. You continue to move by your spirit. Speak to this vessel. Open our ears, our hearts, and our minds to receive what you have for us this day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Last week, Chet Bruett spoke. Didn't he do an amazing job? It was, he did an amazing job. And he left us with uh, scripture that his grandfather would use all the time. And it was basically, be slow to speak and quick to listen. And that really takes us right into where we're going in today's message. Our tongues, our tongues have power. And the words we speak have power. I hear this from Pastor James on a regular basis. What does that mean? That means I'm probably saying things that are on the edge. And he reminds me ever so lovingly and so gently, our words have power. Our words have power. And it's so true. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go fishing, which I just did with my other brother, sitting out there, Bruce, who took me fishing, and you catch fish, and how glorious and how celebratory you are, and what happens when you have one and it gets away. All of a sudden, I don't speak those savory, beautiful, wonderful things. Or you go to the golf course, and you're really shooting for a good score, and you hit a bomb of a drive, and you're feeling good, and the next one, you take a beaver tail divot, and the ball rolls 20 yards. And I call myself names when I'm all by myself. You idiot. What are you doing? Are you kidding me? That's the tongue. Unrestrained, it takes over this body. We all struggle with the tongue. If you don't believe it, I will talk with you for five minutes, and I bet you I can get you to stumble just by listening. <laughs> because our nature is so tied to it, and the tongue is so tied to our hearts. And if our hearts have not been circumcised, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, we tend to let our tongues run loose. How many nice things did I say during the basketball game yesterday? Oh, extra innings for the Brewers. Why didn't he pass the ball? And I'm going back and forth from baseball to basketball, having all kinds of wisdom to say that's no, not wisdom at all. It's my opinion. And that's what just comes out of us. Martin Luther said, he, they say about him that he would spend four to six to eight hours a day repenting every day. Why? Because he probably started the day with good morning and then it went on to other places and he needed to get right to repentance because that's what the tongue does. In Matthew 4.4 4 it says, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. What's the beauty of the words that proceed from the mouth of God? They're not attached to the flesh. It's the mouth of God. So how do we deal with all that? We be filled with God so out of the abundance of our heart, our mouth begins to speak. Do you guys love the worship service? Wasn't that nice? We use the worship service to get our hearts right before God. That's the, that's the prime product. The byproduct is... It prepares you for what you're going to hear. And maybe you can handle it a little bit better. <laughs> Tongue tied. <laughs> a little bit better because you spent some time in the sweetness of God. And it's almost a separation, or a, a picture is a better word, a picture of the worship and the love and the heart and the passion of God. And now you're going to get the truth. 
And so the service becomes something we do in spirit and in truth. And we're going to receive all that today. Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets. So when God speaks, creation happens. Things happen. When he speaks through the prophets and the prophets are speaking on his behalf, out of, out of the abundance of them, they are speaking. And it's good words. And the tongue is used for the glory of God. And in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the expressed image of his person and upholding all things by what? The word of his power. His words are power. But like I said before, so are ours. And they can be used for different kinds of things. Power for the good, power for evil. First point I want to make is that words are powerful to the plus or to the minus. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. Maybe the most frightening scripture in the Bible for anybody that's a teacher or a preacher. Anybody who goes to their neighbor to speak life. The reality and the responsibility of that task is a big deal because we have to use the very article that God has given us, the very um, instrument that God has given us. And we have to use that to speak life when we still operate in a body of flesh. And unless we fill that flesh with the Spirit of God, who knows where that can go. And there's a greater responsibility on those who are speaking the truth, that we speak it as it's meant to be spoken to the best of our ability or to the best that we can do with the Spirit of God in us. Trouble is, we begin to say things oftentimes that we want to say. And I, I, I do this. I begin to preach things that I want to preach. And I don't really follow the script of Scripture. I start to throw in my own ideas. It's not all bad if it's led by the Spirit of God. But if it's not led by the Spirit of God, the stuff I have to say doesn't mean a whole lot. Heavy message, isn't it? Everybody want to line up right now and become a pastor and become a teacher? 1 Timothy 1.5 says, Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and from a sincere faith, from which some, having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. There is a great responsibility for the things that come out of our mouth. And the more that God has called you to a place of doing it, that responsibility becomes greater and greater and greater. And I think, very honestly, the most fearful thing that I have to process, and it's almost emotional, but I have to, I have to process it like, um, Lord, am I saying what you wanted me to say? Because the responsibility of it is real. And if I don't feel this or experience the depth of that statement, I'm in danger. If I'm light and flippant about it, I'm in danger. So every, every Sunday I process, what did I say? Oh, did I say that? Oh, Sally. But what does God do? It says here in the scripture, this is when he steps in and brings grace. He gives me grace because my heart is right and I want to do the, speak the right things. And so does every pastor that steps on the pulpit here. That's their heart. They want to say the right things. And so they put their time in. But don't take lightly the calling of God when it comes to speaking his word. You should be humbled before, it, before him in that. James 3, 2 says, For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in the word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. What does this mean? We're all sinners. We all struggle. We, we have a tough time doing things the way we're supposed to do it. That's all of us. That's all of us. We must be well studied to get up and speak God's word. We need to be spirit-filled, I believe, to speak it rightly with the right spirit. Because the word of God was breathed by the Holy Spirit. So then we go to the next phase of this and it begins to talk about 
the little things that we all have that can steer us in a wrong direction, and they're powerful. The bit, the tongue, the rudder, the spark, all very small things, but look at the impact and the influence that they have. You put a bit in a horse's mouth, and a little child can steer the horse once the horse is broken, and they can control this great big animal. You put a rudder on a ship. You've all seen this before, and a little bitty rudder steers big ships through tough winds. They have power. They're small, but they have power. Talk about a spark that ignites forest fires. What kind of a spark does it take to set off a forest fire in a place that is so filled with fuel that it doesn't just take off and go wild? And what, what James is doing here is he's saying, that's our tongue. That's what our tongue can do. Big impact for such a little implement. That's what the tongue does. It can be a raging forest fire that comes from the pit of hell itself, is what it says. I can turn big ships. I can move people. Some of the, I'll, I can't think of the right word to use to describe them. Some of the most evil men on the face of the earth who did evil to people groups in, in terms of slaughtering and killing people, moved people by their tongue. They moved nations by their tongue. Why? Because there's power in the tongue. And it starts at a young age. And I've seen this in, in my, own, my own family where one, an older one, will say something mean to the next younger one. And just as quick, they hear the bad word, and it's like, it just comes out, and there's such a perfect picture of how it impacts us, but we don't do, ah, we do other things. High school kids sometimes take their lives because of the words of other people. This is the most heartbreaking thing, and in, not in this church, but as a church that ministers out, we've seen it. And we've had, we've had funerals of people that we love, whether students or family, who... It was the words that were spoken to them that crushed their spirit that they couldn't go on. Why? Because there is power in the tongue. And there's a great responsibility for how you use it and the words that you use and choose to speak. And you have to be on your guard. I believe you, you need to walk in the spirit, not just be filled with the Holy Spirit, which is awesome, but you have to walk in that, being refilled all the time. Because we are so prone to go to the negative place. And I'm speaking as an expert of going to the wrong place. If you have a quick tongue, my prayers go out to you. Because that usually doesn't steer, that doesn't always steer in the right direction. If you are slow to speak and quick to listen, maybe you can corral the beast of your tongue before it does the damage and unleashes the damage that it can do to a person. Yes, the things we say are a big deal. And James is not playing around. He's pretty, he's pretty firm. What about the word? Words. Words do matter. In Ephesians 6, 17, it says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. What's he saying there? When you arm yourself, arm yourself with God's words and not your own. Take the sword of the Spirit instead of the sword of the flesh which is meant to hurt and destroy, but the other is to build up, lift up, and change until you get into the spirit, spirit realm. Now the sword of the spirit becomes a weapon for taking down strongholds, for dividing joints and marrow, for the work that God is going to do in an individual. God's words, the sword of the spirit, it is the word of God. Everything can be Everything can be tamed, it says in 3.7. For every kind of beast and bird, reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But in verse 8 it says, But no man can tame the tongue. It is unruly evil, full of deadly poison. No man can control it. I can't. The things I love to do take me to the place where I say things I don't want to say. Are you kidding me? Are you... 
what are you thinking? That's, what, that's my self-talk when I'm out on a golf course. And by the way, most of the time I'm golfing all by myself. It's my retreat. And what am I doing when I'm out there? I'm yelling at me. I'm criticizing me. And by the way, the third shot isn't a whole lot better than the second one when I'm in that tone. If the second shot would, after a second bad shot, if I was to say, oh, it's all right, Jesus loves me. <laughs> I'm good. Four iron, 232 yards on the middle of the green. Giddy, giddy, giddy. I think you're getting my point. I hope you are. If you don't understand the frustration, take up golf. <laughs> Interesting thing about the tongue is, with it, we bless our God and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in the similitude of the likeness of God. How can that be? Oh, it can be. It can be. I can say great things about God and worship. And if I'm not on my guard, I can say hurtful things to people that I love. And I have. The only consolation I get is I know you all have too. None of us are perfect. This is the area where we all struggle. Feel free to stand up if you're the perfect one. It's okay. We'll all look at you. And we'll try not to say liar because that would be a mean thing to say to somebody. It says, out of the same mouth proceeds blessings and curses. Brethren, these things ought not to be. Do not say the words to people that would cause them to even want to be hurt, let alone take their life. One of the gifts of the Spirit is encouragement, and, and it's a gift that's desperately needed in the church. And I have found in this church that there's a deficit of encouragement, encouraging words. People do not know how to be encouraged, and they don't know how to encourage. Ask God for that gift, and you'll get it. Unlike the gifts that man asks out of the world, they ask wrongly, but you ask God for the gift to be an encourager so you speak life to people because everybody in this room needs to hear it. And if you don't think you need to hear it because you're all good to go, you're lying to yourself, you're deeply hurt, and you just as soon avoid the whole thing. It's a big gift. I'm going to embarrass somebody right now, and it's not by, in, not by my uh, intention to embarrass. But we have a woman that runs around here, and she loves about loves on everybody that comes into this place. And I heard it from another brother this week, and she makes you feel welcome. It's an encouraging thing. It, there's encouraging words all over it. That's what we need to be like as believers because of the impact that it has on other people. The things you say matter. It's going to really ruin everybody's lunch that they can't gripe about what they heard today, but so be it. Thank you, Jesus. I said before that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, but it really goes on to explain a little bit deeper in, in Matthew 15, 8. It says, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart. They defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat bacon, it's okay. That doesn't defile me. It makes me a little thicker, but it doesn't defile me. It's the things that come out of my mouth that defile me. Are we kind of getting an idea about this tool that we all have? The importance of using it rightly? But what does this mean? In verse uh, 36, Matthew 12, 36, it says, But I say to you that for every idle word men speak, they will give an account of it on the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Wow. Here's how I see that. We will be standing in one of two um, judgments. If you're a believer, you're going to be standing at the Bema Seat judgment. And the Bema Seat judgment is where you give an account for everything before God who knows everything about you. And you are held responsible for it. But because of Christ in us, he pays the price we should have paid when we fall short when it comes to the words we've spoken or the, the things we've done. But there's the other judgment for those who don't have Christ, and it's called the white throne judgment. And it's at the white throne judgment where you're going to defend everything as well. 
But you have no redeemer behind you. You have no savior to protect you from the outcome of that meeting before God. And so what does that mean for you? That means you're off to the lake of fire, which was meant for Satan and his angels. You're off to hell permanently, permanently apart from God forever. For us believers, we still stand at the, the, the awards judgment, if you will, because everything goes through the fire at the Bama Seat judgment. Every good thing we did, every bad thing, it goes through the fire, and the, the Bible says that the good that comes out of it, it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I believe, the good that comes out of it, I believe, I believe we fashion crowns that we give to Jesus and lay at his feet, just like the, the 24 elders did. The bad things get consumed in the fire. So it's the things that get consumed, not my spirit, not my soul. Those don't get burned in the fire. But the Bible says you'll suffer regret, even there. And I believe it's there, and we say this at funerals all the time, but it's, I believe it's there where Jesus now lifts you up and he wipes away every tear because he's already forgiven you. And now he's embracing you. Come and enjoy what I have for you is what it's like. Second point that I wanted to make. It makes a transition from the tongue and the words that we speak to wisdom. It's interesting how well James did that. He goes to wisdom. So how do you define wisdom? How do you attribute wisdom to your life? How do you take it in and, and live by it? And where does your wisdom come from? James 3.13 says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by his good con conducts that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast, do not lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above. Let me say that again. This was, um, but if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, you do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. If you have these attributes in you, self-seeking, self, Satan's exact location forever, we've said it forever, where does he dwell? In your selfishness, in your selfish person. If those are the attributes in you, that are in you, and you don't have God in you, this is what it's talking about, then where does your wisdom come from? It comes from one of three places. It comes from the world system. It comes from our flesh, which we know is evil. Or it comes from demonic things, the devil. That's where evil comes from. And the words we speak come from this place. So my wisdom, if it comes from that place, I have no good thing in me for any good purpose except self. How many people here like self-serving people? And then it says in verse 17, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing, yet full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. This wisdom that comes from above can only come from above. It is from the Holy Spirit that we get this kind of wisdom. Solomon, with the right heart at the right time, Asked when he could have anything he ever wanted, he said, I want wisdom. Because his heart was right, God gave him wisdom. Now, wisdom in and of itself doesn't save a soul. It gets you, it, it, it's insight from heaven as to how we walk and conduct our lives. In Galatians 5.22 it says, but the fruit of the Spirit, in other words, the gift of the Holy Spirit is love. It's joy, it's peace, or long-suffering, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. That's what comes when we are in Christ, and out of the abundance that, of that in us, when the Spirit of God lives in us, that's what comes out. Is that what comes out of us? Yes and no. It does come out of me, a lot. But sometimes my flesh rears up. And it brings me to a place where I have to repent and ask for forgiveness. And I can do that. And I can do it all the time. Why? Because I belong to Jesus. That's why he came. 
not just for me and my stuff, but he came for mankind and their stuff. Wow. Wow. Where's the wisdom? Does it come from our own intelligence, our own flesh? Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desire for pleasure that war within your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war. You do not have because you do not ask and you do not receive because you have asked amiss that you may spend it on pleasures. What's the issue? The issue is self again. The issue is my pleasures. Everything I do is for my benefit and my pleasure. I'm asking with the wrong motivation. If I had all the wisdom, I would do this, and I would do that, and I would do this for me, for me, for me. And it would be linked to stuff, to stuff, to stuff. Position, position, position. Fame, fame, fame. That's how I work. It's not how it's supposed to be. Third thing, where's your heart? Is it with the world, or is it with the spirit? James 4.4 4 says, adulterers and adulteresses. Do you not, not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. What does that mean? That means when we put the things of this world as the important thing and the stuff that the world has to offer and the thinking that comes from the world, the Bible says that we are at enmity against God. And by the way, that's scripture from back in Genesis when God said after Adam and Eve fell that he will put enmity between him, the man, I mean, and, and Satan. We'll be warring with him if we're in God. If we're not in God, we're with him. There's no rub until eternity comes. Thank you, Jesus, for your clarity. Why does he call it adulterers and adulteresses? Our God is a jealous God. He loves you with a zeal that we can't even understand to the deeper levels. We understand on a good enough le or a good level, but on the deep love that he has for us, we can't comprehend it in our humanity. And he is jealous for us. And he will not give you up to the world system, to the world which pollutes your mind, which separates you from him. He will fight for you. And when you are his, Though you seem like you're in a lost state, he comes for you. He'll leave the sheep from Living Hope Church to go off to the, after the lost sheep because they're his and he pursues them. Why does he pursue them? Because he deeply loves them and he loves you. How do we do in this area of adultery with God? Well, if we say that we have no sin, this is 1 John 1.8. We deceive ourselves, and the truth of God is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we now make him a liar, and his word is not in us. I'm going to break your hearts here. But every one of you in this room, we are sinners. We are saved by the grace of God, but we war against sin at every turn. And if we deny that we're sinners, we're calling God a liar. That's what the Bible says. We are sinners. You know what the beautiful thing is? We're all in this together. That's a beautiful thing. We're all in this together. The real beautiful thing is he's forgiven all of us who are in him. The people that raised their hands this morning, you are now his. You, you have an eternity with God as opposed to an eternity without him. He's going to spend the next years of your life growing you to know him better. By the way, as a little sidebar thing, if you're not growing by the washing of water with the word of God, if you are not studying his word and reading his word, you're not in a great place other than salvation. He wants you to grow to know him. And he will do anything at his means. He will allow things, and things will happen because he desperately loves and wants you and me. Thank you, Jesus. How do I know that we say everybody? We know Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and fall short 
of the glory of God. So if you think you're perfect, you can make an argument and say you're perfect. And if I say you're not perfect, you are broken. I can make an argument, but the reality is if you're perfect, it's not you who's perfect. It's God in you who's perfect. And if you're broken, you're not destitute. Why? Because God is in me, growing me in my brokenness. And by the way, he uses me best when I come with that humble, broken attitude before him. If I think I've arrived, I tend to get lazy. And he's well aware of that as well. Pastor James, if you could come on up, that would be great. Thank you, Jesus. Exodus 25 gives us a picture. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord, am a jealous God. That's what I was speaking about before. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations. We've been through this when we went through Exodus. Of those who hate me. Hate me means haven't accepted him. That's what, that's what that means. But showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. Showing mercy to thousands, not just thousands, but thousands of generations to those that love him. I love him. He is my Lord. He is my Savior. And the older I get, I actually get better at hearing from him. And I, and I get better at listening to him. And then I stumble and I fall and he picks me up and reveals to me by my spirit my sin and it causes me to change. And he works this rubbing and, and, and putting people in my life that rub me and sometimes the wrong way and sharpening me and all for what? That I would be right before him. He is doing a work and an unfinished work. The only thing that's finished in the work in me is that my salvation is secure and sealed because of what Jesus has done. And the last thing I want to share with you is how we come to this place. The world, the flesh, and the devil, is that where our wisdom comes from? Or does it come from above? And he says, and uh, James 4, eight, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinner, and purify your heart, you double-minded. Boy, those are hard words, aren't they? Cleanse your hands speaks to purifying your actions and behaviors. Purify your hearts is to purify your thoughts and motives. You see, when I say that we're not perfect, that we're broken, that we um, are saved, yes, but do we still sin? Yes, why? Because God doesn't just go by the things we can externally see. He digs. He digs and he gets inside and he sees who you really are. He sees what your faith really is. Um, this is me, by the way. I'm, I'm pointing, everything I'm saying to you is, is me. He sees it all. And he, he gives us something. He says, cleanse yourselves. Purify yourselves in your actions and in your thoughts. And if you be really honest, the thoughts are the hardest. When I'm angry, can I say, Lord Jesus, forgive me. Take my anger. I give it to you. I don't want to be like this. And I'm set free right then and there from that anger. Jesus, take this. I struggle in this area. Take this. I give it to you. And he'll, he'll take it. And he'll, he'll deliver me. How do you cleanse yourself? The Bible's clear in Ephesians. And it's what husbands are supposed to do for wives and their family. But we're to wash each other with the word of God. Cleansing by the washing with the water of the word of God. It's the word of God that changes our hearts. It changes our thinking. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How does it get renewed? By being in the word of God. Be in the word of God and let your mind be transformed. Let him cleanse you because that's the work he's going to do with you and me. And then after he says it in verse 9, it says, Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Why? Why would he take away my joy and my, my laughter? Because until I'm with him, it's coming from the wrong place and it does not lead to life. Before I come to God, my laughter and joy is for a season. And he says, be done with it. But when you come to him, it's a little different. What does that look like? 
In James 4.10, it says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Micah 6.8, he has shown me, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. Oh. James, I went way past before you were born. <laughs> but then what does God do when we come to him? Psalm 30, 11 says, You have turned for me a mourning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with ashes, with gladness, to the end that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. Oh, Lord, my God, I will give thanks. My God has turned my morning into dancing for thee. Keep going. They were born in a couple different decades. Maybe, I guess. A couple maybe about four or five too, different decades. Cool. Yeah, different keys. What key are we in there? You guys, that was beautiful. I'm wondering. <laughs> he will turn mourning from the world into dancing. The joy from the world, it's not even really joy. The temporary happiness from the world, he will turn to joy when you come to Christ. The people that raised their hands today, the decision was greater and deeper than you even know that you put your hand up today to receive Jesus. It is the biggest deal we can all make because it's about how God makes us right before him. And in his eyes, we're already right before him because of what Christ has done for us. So when I said at the beginning of the service, if you, if you ponder this and think about it and you weren't able to raise your hand, think about it throughout the service. There's no thing you can do that he can't forgive. How beautiful is that? How beautiful is it with all the crud that we've all done and we stand before the throne and our stuff's going through the fire and we're just weeping and broken and it's burned. And then he picks you up and he wipes the tears from your eyes. He said, child, you are mine. Come, let me show where you're going to dwell. I prepared a place for you. When you come to Christ, he's already preparing the place for you. Right now, that's the beauty, one of the beauties of salvation. There's many. And he brings a close to the whole thing when he tells us, do not judge a brother. Don't judge brothers and sisters in Christ. I know there's a couple of slippery scriptures in there, for slippery for some of you. But there are also other scriptures that say, you know, look at the plank in your own eye before you look at the speck in your brother's eye. Judging is kind of like speaking, like I spoke about at the beginning. There's a high responsibility to judge rightly. And if it's not done for the glory of God and it's not done with the love of God, then shutty. Don't speak. Hold those thoughts to yourself and ask God to forgive you for the thoughts because he looks that deep in you. We're not called to judge people. We're called to encourage, to bless, to lift up people. That's a different kind of judging. And I didn't take the time to look in the Greek what that means, but I'm sure it's something along the lines of what I'm telling you right now in the English. So I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. And if there's anybody here that you said, yes, I've heard the message. I, I felt it at the beginning. I couldn't raise my hand before. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand right now, nice and high, if you want to receive this, this judge of ours, this lover of ours, this Jesus of ours, this Savior. Yes, sir, I see that hand. You can put yours down. Is there anybody else? If you want to receive Jesus today, let your mourning, your grieving turn to dancing. Is there anybody else? Hallelujah. We're going to pray once again for the brother that just raised his hand. Dear Jesus, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your spirit. And for speaking to me, Holy Spirit, by your word. And for speaking to me, Holy Spirit, by your word. You've touched my heart. You've touched my heart. And I receive. And I receive. What you have for me. 
that you have for me. Be my Lord. Be my Lord. And be my Savior. Be my Savior. In Jesus' name.